Welcome everyone. My name is Dane Sherman. I'm the interim head of reference at Sims Memorial Library and your host for this evening's event. Readings at Sims Library started about 18 years ago as a main event for National Library Week, which celebrates va the valuable role of libraries, librarians, and library workers uh, and how they make an influence in the culture and our campus and all of our communities. Over the years, this event has become an entertaining showcase for talented writers on campus and in our community who read aloud some of their original works. COVID uh, prevented uh, the event from taking place last year, and that's why we're meeting virtually instead of in person this year. After the year we've had, I can't wait to hear what everyone has written and what everyone's working on. Today, we're happy to have Chad Foray of the English Department as our keynote presenter. Chad Foray grew up in Independence, Louisiana. He, is, he graduated from Southeastern with an MA and BA in English, as well as a PhD in English from the University of Southern Mississippi in Hattiesburg. Recent work appears or is forthcoming in Electric Literature, Cut Bank, Bayou Magazine, Prime Number Magazine, Flock, Barely South Review, and Best New Poets, among other journals and anthologies. Welcome, Chad. Please uh, read from your work. Um, Pontchartrain Plaza, one. Those young magnolias outside the conservatory, the ballet of Aviv hum in the likeness of arrowheads. Waiting rooms are wheeled in. The pigeons are pale and drink rust water from a horizontal tire. Satellite dishes flex, defunct. What a dangerous place to daydream a plaza. There's no pretending, and the closest you'll get to the sea is remembering a movie or someone is waiting for you down there wrapped in dawn. Two. You smell like you've been thinking of horses all day. A lifetime of brushes spill from your hair. Sometimes your face trembles like a country where no one means to be happy and ballparks just start jarring honey where the rhythms of worm and sick corn stalks couldn't eat another ode patios sick with sugar ants statues handsome in a heat mirage lassoed and dragged to the ditch a raft but for the blood another door in the Ornada de Muerto, Audrey, before he died of being full of danger, Pablo made me promise to be beautiful, to never go through the streets or dip the ends of my eyes in blood without a green knife, something to say in the harmless warmth. We may never get back here. That soft yellow two-story place in the Spanish style was a movie house, remember? Marilyn, who pitied horses, danced the desert conscious while Clark watched. They don't open doors in Niagara. Too many bodies in the bell tower. At the movie house, they exclusively served expired snack cakes. Everyone should have to see a horse experience a storm for the first time, and it should be a sin not to sneak into a movie house. We seemed to feed the fireflies our laughter, always laughing, even when I read about the roaches, straight razors eating from the eyes like a record needle, music carving circles in a mirror, like when you hear a sound or phrase so right, you have to hum. Every once in a while, you notice you're the only animal at home 
and no one is waiting to remember you. And no, there's not a person with a different perfume in each individual eyelash waiting to be squeezed like honeysuckle. Someone you can turn to and say, I think you're the talking I've been with all day. Someone to help you miss a movie house and a dog that lives to bite the air, the right there. Again, I climbed into a taxi with all your time. The dog you don't even own yet hears your disc slip. Our home is a lilac dropped at the feet like cigars or the afternoon. All those fortresses at the mercy of my breathing. Driving by the movie house can turn you confident enough to make a noise. Regret small things like owning one too many clocks. The trouble of objects that give you no trouble. One day, all at once, your neighbors realize they're old and in the wrong room. And I'll just wish I had been there the night you got your eyes. Who wouldn't want their whole life to be a funeral for a movie house? And who can afford to live in a house with a person no one bothered to name? The mind is a generous butcher. You've forgotten me like a child spending his entire life in a water tower. At least I was always a laugh. Just one more dance before we fade to vacation footage. Perhaps it's not a sad idea to stay children, a home without money, laughed human. What I mean is many families moved, were moved in this house. That's all. What kind of families? Who cares? I was going underground until I touched you. Now I want to be old and realize the room I'm in is not what I meant. When I watch movies, I often think about the time my teacher hugged his daughter like a haunted rocking chair. Was I watching a soldier disintegrate? Was I a bird crying on pictures of more beautiful birds? I think of how the angel left Mary in Luke like my grandpa left Nilda with hell on her hands, shrinking in some coffee shop. Stay for the morning, I'd say, my wings a torn movie ticket. You'll like getting born. And this is my, uh, my last poem. This has everything to do with the Tarantula Nebula. Even here, floating in 30 Doradas, my favorite eight-legged clown face, I'm full of furniture. My wife openly admits she wants to wear me or shrink me down until I can eat crumbs off a coin. If she was on my shoulder, I'd sit just inside the shade, lean forward if she wanted some warmth. I once spun a grape on her nose like a basketball and gravity just stood up and left. Out here, you don't need laws, just whatever skin you want to celebrate in a future to feed yourself. Tired angels picture knuckles shaved by candlelight. There's nothing to do in space but think of family. Before my father unicycled, he rose always like crab traps at twilight, just blue king grins, shell heaps. Everyone was young and could disappoint anything. We were playing football on the KC Hall levee when I entered orbit. It was early October. The cold had its claws out. The sun was always in your eyes. It came down exactly like a dry beignet, thumb with a drill wound or a flamingo kettlebell. My dad was in nothing but these puke colored pants with suspenders hanging down and several giant zippers. The color the sun is when no one is looking. The color also of my mother's eyes, which were also prosthetic. It's her frightening cough, an indescribable smallness, her hands like flowers in an old photograph. 
She caught everything, even though she shouldn't have been able to. My dad was mostly standing there smoking. I spiked the ball in the dirt when I scored and to celebrate, I turned into a tornado. Bluish levee birches stayed dead, like a crowd of hands reaching out to a helicopter or chickens shot into the ground. Beautiful, the flood walls, smooth, like a killer in a movie where everyone is in their underwear and doomed and chalk lines almost erased. There's something to October with its slow games. In space, there's nothing to do but dream of growing close to someone. You always inflate, fly above a neighborhood, squirming purple yards, like the very bottom of the dream is boiling. You hear some voices chanting like a whisper in the sky, chitterlings and satin pie, chitterlings and satin pie. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chad. We this beautiful. Uh, last Chad read as a student um, in our series, and it has not been all that long ago. And it was uh, I, Chad may have been an undergraduate when he read uh, on the third floor. Was that right, Chad? Were you an undergraduate or a graduate um, student? I don't remember. Well, um, I don't. Almost the next time I saw him. He had a PhD. So if any of you are interested in getting a PhD or getting a PhD in English or creative writing, he is the guy to talk to because virtually no one I have ever met got the degree as fast as he did. And he has accomplished a great deal. And we're so uh, happy to uh, to celebrate Dr. Chad Foray's work. So thank you for reading Thanks. for us, uh, Chad. Yeah, thank you so much. Our second reader is uh, Getty Langwa. Uh, Getty was born and raised in Middle Tennessee until he and his family moved to Walker, Louisiana. He is a sophomore here at Southeastern working uh, toward a BA in creative writing. Getty has been writing since kindergarten when he placed first in the school's writing competition. Please uh, read from your work, uh, Getty. Thank you. So uh, I'm going to be reading a short story that I wrote last semester. It's uh, The White House. Every Easter and Thanksgiving, my family travels to the tiny town of Valiant, Oklahoma. There, at the end of a narrow dirt road called Blackard Lane, is the house my great-great-grandparents built when they first came from Ireland. The house is quite large, having five bedrooms and three bathrooms. It was painted in an off-white which is how it earned its name, the White House. The original paint applied by Mama and Papa Blackard has long since chipped off and been replaced. Every holiday, the new paint seems to chip just a little bit more. The house sits on a large piece of property, about 550 acres. The land there is beautiful as could be. A deep, fast-moving creek runs through the middle of it, and not far from the house, it widens into a spot which we simply call the swimming hole. Down along the creek, there are all kinds of wildlife to be seen, along with a few of the family's cows. A bit further down the creek, about a quarter mile, you can find a trail that leads you to a field full of prickly pear cactus. I often take the younger cousins here and teach them the sometimes painful process of picking the fruit and removing the spines, which are later turned into preserves. Along the, uh, the field runs a tree line that, when followed, leads to the water mill, the mill houses the largest tornado shelter. Tornadoes are always a threat when staying at the White House. After exploring the woods, hunting, fishing, helping feed cows, and cleaning the prickly pears, you can walk inside the house. Surrounding the house is a chain link fence. After walking through the gate, you step onto a cobblestone path that leads to the porch. The porch has three porch swings and four rocking chairs, all of which are always full. The middle of the porch since the front doors centered perfectly in the building. I can remember my first time walking through that door vividly. So the White House always has such a peculiar scent. Cousin Eddie would always be burning pine in the fireplace. Whenever there was a fire, Uncle Odell and Uncle Otis were always close by. Aunt Jack and Edith would always be cooking something good. 
The smells of Thanksgiving ham, cobbler, and burning pine all mixed together, creating a type of immediately recognizable medley as soon as you walk through the door. Smells themselves are so delicious that, for a moment, you can tone out the noise of little cousins yelling, babies crying, and the elderly trying to talk over their own deafness. Last time I went, I was about 12 years old. Haven't been able to go nearly as often as I would like. My parents didn't get along well with the rest of the family. So, this time, I told my parents goodbye and hopped in my aunt's van for the 12-hour ride to Valiant. Our crew consisted of my Aunt Monica and Uncle Wade, their children, Gavin and Sydney, Sydney's friend, Jordan. Gavin is around my age, born just a few months after me. Sydney and Jordan are a few years behind us. Gavin and I have always been at odds with one another, despite being best friends throughout most of our childhood. Despite this, we were all excited, and we could barely sit still in that cramped little van. For the most part, the ride was relatively peaceful. There was no bickering, arguing, or fighting between siblings or cousins, which was quite a rare event. We stopped for food a few times, and we ended up on Blackard Lane well ahead of schedule. The first day at the White House is always the most exhausting. What should we do first? Gavin asked. We narrowed it down to two choices. We could go swimming, or we could go up to the red dirt hill and dig out little caves. There wasn't a unanimous decision, so we decided that it would be best if we did both before supper. We crossed the bridge to the other side of the creek and headed up, up for the hill. Up on that hill, there was a massive washout that could easily be dug out with sticks and bare hands. We had been at this for quite some time when our Mississippi cousins showed up. Mickey and Travis didn't have the best track record with anyone in the family. But this was especially true with Gavin, Sydney, and I. It wasn't long after they arrived that Travis pushed Sydney into the dirt, and of course, she began crying. I've always looked out for Sydney, partially because she's my little cousin, and partly because she was always the nicest to me. So, after the incident, my natural course of action was to confront Travis and hold him accountable for his crime. Why'd you do that? I asked. I thought I was big and bad, but I was still just a scrawny 12-year-old boy, and Travis was at least 50 pounds heavier than me and a good half foot taller. Of course, things got heated, and I ended up landing a good punch right beneath his left eye. Of course, things did not go well for me. Hit me with a quick jab to the gut. I was winded, but I quickly got up. I went for another punch, but I missed and was rewarded with a swift jab to the side of my head. My grandmother showed up to the scene. She said, so Gaddy, why do you hit him? I said, because he pushed Sid to the ground and made her cry. She's my cousin. She said, well, Gaddy, he's your cousin too. And like it or not, you can't get rid of him. Family isn't chosen, it's provided. And even when y'all disagree, you've just got to make the best of it. After this fiasco, I walked down to the bridge and sat there with my feet dangling off the side, just letting my legs swing as though I had no control over them. Sydney and Jordan joined me not too long after, and not a word was said because we all knew what everyone would say anyways. Sydney would have been grateful, Jordan would have said I did the right thing. While the fight wasn't what I would call a pleasurable experience, it wasn't the biggest fight I had been in, nor would it even be the last of the trip. We eventually worked our way down to the creek so Gavin and I could do some fishing, and thankfully, neither Mickey nor Travis were present. Gavin and I both had a rod, and we shared a small tackle box. We fished until we had a few buckets of small bass and brim and headed back up to the house. It started getting dark by the time we made it back, and Eddie was out playing horseshoes using nothing but the remaining slivers of sunlight to see. You could always tell when he would make a point because of the distinct metallic ding the horseshoes made when they would hit the stake. We brought the fish up to the porch before running inside to grab our jackets. Cleaning fish had never been such a pleasurable experience. The words of my grandmother keep, kept echoing in my head. Like it or not, you can't get rid of them. Family isn't chosen, it's provided. So for the first time, I set aside the biases towards my family that my parents had instilled in me. We sat, clean fish, laughed, and we were happy. There was no judgment from anyone towards anyone. Mickey and Travis eventually joined us, and we welcomed them with open arms. After all, they were my family too. Apologies were granted to one another, and as we all sat around cleaning fish, I formed a closer bond with these people than I had ever felt with anyone else. 
When it eventually got too cold to stay outside any longer, we left the unclean fish on the porch and covered buckets to be kept cold by the brisk autumn air. After a quick supper and a long game of dominoes, we were soon off to bed. The trip continued on about like this until the sixth day. We had been away from home for nearly a week and we were to leave early the following morning. Everyone was busy packing, cooking breakfast, or wrangling children. Tensions in the house were high. Of course, with rising tensions came an inevitable encounter between Gavin and me. We were all on the front porch taking a break from packing when Gavin decided to make a snide comment about my mother. Can't remember exactly what he said. All I remember is how instantly furious I was. And I would always defend my mother, just as she would always defend me. I remember giving him this look, a look that I could never recreate. Here we go, said Jordan, as she casually took a seat on one of the porch swings. Remember how I said the scuffle between me and Travis wasn't the worst fight of the trip? This one was the worst of the two. We had our words, and he threw the first punch. His swing landed on my shoulder, and I retaliated with a blow to his side. He swung back at my head and missed, but he swung again, hitting me on my nose. All I could feel was a burn, and then I could smell the smell of blood, almost like how your hands smell after fumbling through a pocket full of change. I felt the warmth of the blood start to run down my face, and all of a sudden those words came back to me. Like it or not, you can't get rid of them. So, instead of, instead of punching back, I just tried to wrestle him to the ground. He tried to buck me off like a raging bull, and the last thing I remember is falling off the porch. I woke up not too long after, and Gavin was looking down at me crying these huge alligator tears. I thought I killed him. Oh my god, I thought he was dead. He was hysterical, and all I could do was look at him and laugh. After the family veterinarian checked me out, both Gavin and I were given a stern talking to. We then walked down to the creek and sat on that old wooden bridge, talking for hours. At some point, I flashed a good smile. Oh my God, Gavin said. I said, what? Your tooth. What about it? He said, I think I broke it when I knocked you off the porch. We stared at each other for a few seconds and then began to laugh. It wasn't worth spending the last day at the White House mad. I wanted to spend the rest of the day simply taking in the scenery. The bare oak and maple trees swayed lightly in the breeze, almost as if the smallest branches were skating on air. As I stood on top of the highest hill, I could see the smaller hills running off into the distance. The cattle pasture was covered in bright green ryegrass, and the blades swayed to the wind. The air there is always fresh and clean, so clean that it feels like your lungs are drying out if you breathe in too much at once. I sat down on an old oak stump and looked around, taking in everything I saw before me. It wasn't until I looked back at the glowing windows of the White House that I realized how late it was getting. So I threw on my jacket, ran back towards the house, made it just in time for supper. At the end of the day, everything was all right. Despite a terrible start, the day finished with good food, good conversation, and good family. We left early the next morning, just as the sun was coming up. We all piled into the minivan and waved our goodbyes through the, rear through the rear window. As I looked back, the White House was shrinking in the distance as those words entered my mind one last time. Like it or not, you can't get rid of them. Family isn't chosen, it's provided. And even when y'all disagree, you've just got to make the best of it. This thought stayed in my mind until the White House was no longer a house, but just a white speck in the distance. Thank you, Getty. Thank you so much for the story. We really appreciate it. Um, our third reader is Mateo Cheney Martinez. Uh, Mateo is an early college student here at Southeastern. Though born in Seattle, Washington, he has lived in Mandeville, Louisiana uh, for the past seven years. After graduating from high school this May, Mateo aspires to earn a BA and MBA at the University of Alabama. He's passionate about communications in many forms as evidenced through his love of reading, writing, public speaking, and even ballroom dance. Today, Mateo will share part of a piece entitled Office Hours. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to share a little bit about a piece, a little bit of a piece called Office Hours. 
And I'm only gonna share the second half. So I wanna provide a little bit of context on, on the front end. And I'm in my first college class at this point and I have my first exam coming up. And at first I was really hesitant. I was like, I don't know what to, I don't know what to do. But after a little deliberation, maybe a little bit of persuasion from my mom, um, I was persuaded to go ahead and write out a sample response to one of the questions that we had online on Moodle and to take it into my professor in office hours. And that's where the story picks up. Already late Monday evening when I typed up my response, it didn't take long for Wednesday morning to roll around. On my way to campus, I debated my options. His office hours are from 9 to 10.30 and 2 to 3 today. Should I go visit him before class or afterward? Temporarily indecisive, I decided to postpone the decision until I was on campus and better able to gauge when would fit my schedule. Being a slow morning, it wasn't long until I was in front of Fayard Hall, looking up at the imposing building. This is a bold step, I thought. I'm gonna talk one-on-one -on -one with a professor. Entering the hall, I could feel my anxiety building with each step. My doubt began to speak. It'd be much easier to just wait until late. No, I caught myself. Let's do this now. I approached the staircase, noting the students hanging out on their phones, awaiting their next class. It was a funny moment, honestly. There I was, stepping wildly out of my comfort zone, and no one else even knew. They couldn't hear my heart pounding or my thoughts racing. They probably didn't even see me walk to the staircase. It's like that sometimes when you do something new. You think people are going to notice, cheer you on, share some encouragement, maybe even a story. They're going to support you, and once you make it through it, they're going to celebrate your great triumph. But the truth is, most battles are fought in silence. They're fought within your mind. And no one else even knows you're fighting them until you've already won or lost. It was with this loneliness that I walked up the stairs. My doubt had not quieted. It only got louder. Are you sure this is a good idea? He might be super busy and you just be interrupting. I kept walking. Passing the second floor was much like the first. Students lined the halls, eyes glued to their devices, just waiting for their next class. No one knew I was going to office hours for the first time. And honestly, no one cared. By the time I reached the third floor, doubt was trying to steal the show. My mind flooded with misgivings as a professor walked past me, her pace brisk. Looking around, I quickly realized they were in the majority. The distracted students were gone. Only professors remained. Students aren't really supposed to come up here, now are they? My doubt, again, reminding me this was a mistake. Let's just go downstairs and come back this afternoon. It'll be less scary then. The argument felt convincing. I probably should come back later. It would be easier. I was just about to turn around when I surprised myself. From somewhere within me, a little bit of bravery squeaked out. At the very least, let's go find Dr. Serbeck's office. It's such a long walk. Let's just check while we're already up here anyway. A little spark of determination was all it took. I was walking again, albeit more hesitantly. Down the main hall I went, peeking at the play cards denoting which professors were where. After walking for what felt like ages, I finally found Dr. Serbeck's play card. His office, situated at the back of an off-shooting hallway, was just steps away. My whole quest had led to this. And then I walked away. Dow had carried me back to the stair halfway back to the staircase by the time that nagging ounce of bravery returned. Let's just see if he's in there. Hesitating for half a second, I heard the encouragement I needed. Come on, you've got this, said that little spark. Spurred by this encouragement, I walked back down the hall. Reaching the offshooting hall's entrance, entrance, I took a bold step. And another. And another again. Soon I was facing Dr. Serbeck's door plain and brown, except for a massive Beatles poster, each band member's face half shrouded in shade. Hesitating for another moment, Doubt returned to the driver's seat, speaking with urgency. If he were really in there, wouldn't he leave the door open? Let's just go downstairs. You've already done plenty. My willpower nearly drained, I followed. Left foot, right foot, and left again, I made my way out of the off-shooting hall but my little spark of bravery just wouldn't quit. In a last ditch effort, it said, look, 
that professor's door is open. Let's just ask him if Dr. Serbeck is in there. And down the hall, I went again. It was an absurd form of tug of war between my doubt and my bravery, but I was so glad bravery was winning. Lightly knocking on the professor's open door, I said, um, hi, do you, do you know if Dr. Serbeck is in his office? His syllabus says this is his office hours, but his, his door is closed. Glancing up from his computer, he gave me a gentle smile. I realized my doubt wasn't novel. Other students had also been nervous, attending office hours for the first time. The prof professor's reply was gentle. He's probably in there. Yeah. Why don't you go ahead and knock? Oh, okay. I will, I said, blushing. Thank you. He nodded, a slight chuckle escaping as he looked back to his computer. Taking the two steps from his door to Dr. Serbex, I checked in with my doubt one final time. Are you sure you're okay with this? Doubt's response was not what I expected. Are you kidding me? You're gonna walk out of this hall without knocking? Can you imagine how dumb you looked at that professor? He certainly had a point there. Planting my feet firmly in front of Dr. Serbeck's plain door, I drew in a deep breath. We were doing this. We were actually going to visit him in office hours. Bracing myself, I knocked. Come in, Dr. Serbeck boomed his voice deeply resonant, echoing through the door. Turning the handle and slipping it open, I saw him turn in his chair. He recognized me immediately. Hey, it's Mateo, right? You're in my 11 o'clock today. Yes, sir, I mustered. Quite surprised he knew who I was. Fantastic, well, what can I do for you today? Hesitating for only half a moment, I said, I'm, I'm a little worried on about Monday's exam. He just nodded, so I continued. I'm actually a high school junior, and this is my first college exam, so I have no idea what to expect. Yeah, he said. I'm planning to talk about that in class today. It's probably going to be most people's first college exam. He paused, a faraway look in his eyes as he recalled his own first exam. The truth is, it's just the next step up from high school. So if you do well in high school, then you should do well here. Again, he paused. Seeing my neutral expression, he asked, does that ease some of your worries? Nodding, I said, yeah, it does. I thought about thanking him and leaving, but my little spark of bravery encouraged me to keep going. Pulling out my pre written response, I continued, hey, while we're here, I wrote a response to one of your practice questions on Moodle. Would you be willing to read it and grade it just so I can be a little more confident? Smiling, he said, yeah, I can do that. His eyes turned to the printed page as I handed it to him. Squinting a little at my, times, at my 12 point Times New Roman font, he, not, he read, nodding as he went. This is good, he said, looking up. If you wrote something like this on the exam, you'd get an A. A week later, an A is exactly what I got. But I got far more than a simple grade. Leaving Dr. Serbeck's office, I was far more confident than I'd been entering it. College had thrown me something new, but through asking questions and acting with an ounce of confidence, I was able to find an answer. If I could do it once, surely I could do it again. Perhaps an equally valuable lesson, I learned that professors are people too. Yes, they have PhDs and some firmly held opinions, but they're also teachers. They love students and they love their area of study. Trust me, just ask and they will happily tell you about it. Before visiting Dr. Serbeck, I thought office hours were a time for remedial students to get extra help. But now I know they're a chance for engaged students to explore passions, develop meaningful relationships, and have great fun, even as a high school junior. Thank you, Mateo. We really appreciate it. Beautiful. Thank you. Our fourth and final reader is Dalen Wilson. Dalen is a senior at Southeastern working toward a BA in creative writing. She is a lover of all things magical and fantastical across all forms of media. And after completing her undergraduate degree, she plans to go to graduate school in pursuit of a master's degree in English. What she'll do with that degree, she doesn't know, so please don't ask. So, Dalen, please read from your work. Hi, everybody. Um, today I'm going to read two of my short stories. They are fairy tales. The first of them is called La Jardinière et les Fleurs. Not so long ago, 
in a land not so very different from our own, there lived a girl who could speak with the flowers. She was the sole caretaker of the Queen Jardin, and the vast sea of brightly colored blossoms that grew there flourished under her gentle guidance. In the garden, there grew every variety of flower known to man. White lilies, red roses, fields upon fields of brilliant purple lavender. One could spend a lifetime walking its paths to view and name them, and many did. Their queen was a fair queen, and all were welcome. The girl had begun tending to the flowers as soon as she was able to walk, as had her mère and her grand-mère, and all of the women came before her. The women in her family had been blessed, it was said, with la langue de fleur many centuries ago, and each of them had possessed it ever since. And so it was that each day, the girl would emerge from her cottage in the middle of the lilies, dress, and begin her duties in the garden. She saw the company of no one save for her flowers, and even as they grew older, and she, as she grew older and came of age to marry, her gaze never lingered on even the most handsome of the many jeunes who walked the paths of the garden from dawn to dusk, hoping to catch her eye. One day, the queen summoned the girl to the throne room. There she found both the queen and a young man who looked to be just a little older than she. The queen introduced him as the apothecary from the neighboring queendom and announced that the two of them would be wed. The apothecary, she explained, was capable of producing medicine from some of the rare flowers hidden inside the garden, medicine that their kingdom was sorely in need of, queendom. In return for his aid, he asked only the hand of la belle jardinière. The young apothecary through all of this was silent and the girl found herself wary of him. His skin reminded her of Lily of the Valley and his eyes were like two dark berries, the fruit of nightshade. He smiled at her, but his smile did nothing to dampen her growing sense of unease and so she refused to marry him. The fair queen decided that rather than punish the girl for her disobedience, she would simply give her the remaining of the day to, th to think on it. Thus, the girl returned to her garden and the apothecary to his village. That night, the girl prepared herself a cup of tea and left it on the windowsill to steep while she bathed. When she returned from her bath, she heard an urgent whisper from the lilies. Do not drink, they warned her, for he seeks to control you. He hath come in your absence and added potion to your cup. Hearing this, the girl placed the cup carefully inside a cupboard and went to sleep. The next day, the fair queen summoned her once more and commanded her to wed the young apothecary. Still, she refused, and so the fair queen decided to grant her a second day of reflection. The girl returned to her garden, finished her tasks for the day, and retired to her cottage to draw herself a bath. As the water ran, she left again to gather a few herbs with which to perfume her hair. When she entered the cottage once more, she heard the urgent whispers of the lilies. Do not bathe, they warned her, for he seeks to weaken you. He hath come in your absence and added sickness to your bath. Hearing this, the girl retrieved a small jar from her cupboard and took with it a little of the poisoned water. This she placed in the cupboard next to the tea, drew a fresh bath, and went to sleep. The next day, the fair queen summoned the girl to the throne room once more, and once again declared that she would marry the apothecary. Still, the girl refused, and so the queen decided to grant her one more day to change her mind. The girl returned to the garden, cared for the flowers, and went inside to her evening meal. She was greeted upon entry by the whispers of the lilies. Do not eat, they warned her, for he seeks to kill you. He hath come in your absence and added poison to your food. Hearing this, the girl put a little of the bread from the meal into the cupboard and went to bed without supper. The next day, she was summoned to the throne room once more. This is your final warning, the queen said to her. You must marry the apothecary today, or I shall be forced to punish you for your disobedience. I will marry him, the girl replied, but first I would like a feast. The queen agreed, and a grand festin was prepared for her and the apothecary, with the queen to sit in a chaperone. Though there were servants enough to prepare the food, the girl insisted on preparing the meal for her future Melvi herself. First, she set before him a bowl of water with which to cleanse his hands. Bathe, she instructed him, waiting by his side. You must cleanse your hands before the meal. He did as she said, and upon dipping his fingers into the water, he grew faint and breathless. The girl returned again with a silver goblet, filled to the brim with dark liquid. Drink, she instructed him, waiting by his side. You must whet your appetite before the meal. Finding himself both unwilling and unable to take the goblet, the apothecary sat motionless. The girl took the goblet and pressed it to his lips. Too weak to resist, he swallowed the dark liquid and found it to be tea. As soon as the first droplet landed on his tongue, his eyes grew blank. The girl set down the goblet and turned to the queen. Your Highness, these past three nights, this man has sought to do me harm. He slipped potion into my tea so that he might control me, added sickness to my bath so that he might weaken me, and added poison to my bread so that he might kill me. Is this true? The queen asked of the young man, but he stared ahead, silent. 
The girl instructed him to speak and to tell the truth. Under the girl's control now, thanks to the potion, he nodded and admitted that what she had said was true. The fair queen frowned and stood. Then I shall not permit you to marry her and you shall be punished for your wrongdoings. The girl smiled and producing a piece of the bread from the night before, asked the queen if she might decide his punishment. The queen agreed and she placed it before the apothecary. Eat, she instructed him, standing by his side. You must taste the fruits of your own dark labors. Unable to resist her, the young man ate. Not more than a morsel of the bread had passed his lips when he began to gag, and soon after fell motionless against the back of the chair, black eyes staring up at the ceiling. He was dead. The girl's cunning and heroic actions had saved the queendom from being exposed to the evils of the wicked apothecary, and so the queen threw a grand feast and a ball in her honor. All the eligible men of the kingdom attended, and all of them longed for a dance with her, but she danced with no one. When La Fête at last came to an end, the queen asked her what she would like as the reward for her bravery. The girl responded that she wished to be allowed to remain unmarried and tend to the garden for the rest of her days. The queen agreed, and La Jardinière et les Fleurs lived happily ever after. The end. And then my other story is called The Siren and the Harpist, or the story of the orphan girl. There was once a modest village which was situated on the bank of a small but powerful river on the outer edges of the queendom. It was said that the river had been cursed long ago, for it harbored no fish, no frogs, neither cats' tails nor clumps of moss. It was barren of all living creatures. But the people of the village seldom dared to go near it. Many said that when its waters were calm, one could look upon it and see themselves perfectly reflected, as in a looking glass. While the sun shone, the river's waters were placid, blue as the day and speckled with the slowly drifting clouds above. Come moonrise, however, its waters were indistinguishable from inky black night all but the tiniest pinpricks of starlight swallowed by its turbulent current. No one in the village dared walk the riverbank after sunset, save for a young woman known to all as the orphan girl. Each night at moonrise, she would sit by the riverside and sing to it, and it was for this that she was also called the siren. Any and all who heard her song were drawn to it and to her, and so each night as she sang, a small crowd would gather around her. As entranced by her voice as the villagers were, however, they also feared its power. Thus, they never approached the girl or spoke to her. If they should pass her walking in the street, they averted their eyes and crossed themselves, careful to maintain their distance. The girl never commented on their behavior, only walking on in silence. One night, as the moon rose, the girl took her seat by the riverside and began to sing. Even as a small crowd formed around her, birds flew from their perches in nearby trees, squirrels scattered, and the chirping of all the crickets on the river bank came to a halt as they fled. The humans gathered found themselves chilled to the bone, but strangely unable to look away or cover their ears. The orphan girl sang that night for quite some time, and once she had finished, the crowd quickly dispersed. The girl lay down by the water's side, but sat up again when she heard, for the first time, footsteps approaching. She turned to see that it was another girl, a traveler by the look of her, about her age and carrying with her a small harp. What do you sing to? asked the harpist. The orphan girl looked back at the water, quiet a moment before answering. I sing to the river. Of what do you sing? I sing of pain. The heart seated herself next to her and the orphan girl shied away. What ails you? Without answering, the orphan girl stood and left. After some time staring at the river, the harpist gathered her harp and returned home. The following night as the moon waned, the orphan girl seated herself on the side of the river as was her habit and began to sing to its waters. The birds fled the trees in twos as did the squirrels and crickets and the humans watching grabbed onto each other for comfort dispersing as soon as the song was ended. Only the harpist remained. Do you sing to the river? I do, said the or orphan girl without turning. Of what do you sing? I sing of solitude. The harpist seated herself at her side and the orphan girl shied away. What confines you? Without answering, the orphan girl stood and left. After some time, the harpist gathered her harp and returned home. When the moon rose on the next night, it was but a sliver, nearly imperceptible behind the clouds. The siren took up her place at the riverside, singing that night a ballad so deep and sorrowful that the birds felt the weight of it on their wings and thus were flightless, and the squirrels and crickets let, let the, felt their tails grow heavy and hopped about the grass no longer. The humans who heard it fell instantly to tears and fled as soon as the song was ended for a shame of it. Once more, the harpist lingered and approached. Do you sing to the river tonight? I do, said the siren without turning. Of what do you sing? A sing of despair. The harpist seated herself at her side and the orphan girl stiffened. 
What burdens you? Without answering, the orphan girl stood and left. After some time, the harpist stood and returned home. On the following night, darkness descended. And though the hour grew later and later, no moon gleamed from the sky and no song could be heard from the banks of the river. The villagers crossed themselves and thanked the stars that they could sleep in peace tonight without the burden of the siren song. Others danced and rejoiced, drunkenly giddy as they passed the night in celebration at what appeared to be the siren's disappearance. Only one, only one among them ventured down to the riverside, the harpist. And when she arrived, she found the siren sitting on the rank with her legs up to her knees in the water. The harpist approached slowly. Do you sing to the river tonight? I do not. What stalls you? The river has no need for my song, said the siren without turning, nor has anyone. I have, said the harpist, and sat down a little away from her. Your voice is beautiful to me. The siren said nothing. The harpist picked up her harp. Would you sing one last time and allow me to accompany you? After a few moments of silence, the siren began to sing, and the harpist accompanied her. Each somber note the siren sang, the harpist matched with gaiety. When the siren sang of misery, the harpist played of delight, and as the siren lamented, the harpist uplifted. When the song was ended, the siren said nothing, only glanced at the harpist before returning her gaze to the water. The harpist set down her harp and moved closer to her, letting her own legs slip into the turbulent river. This time, the siren did not shy away, and so the harpist took her hand. On the first night I heard you, said the harpist, you sang to us of pain. On the second night, you sang to us of solitude. On the third night, you sang only of despair, never of pleasant things. No such things exist in this world, said the siren, salt tears filling into the fresh water, at least not for me. If I can prove that they do, replied the harpist, brushing her tears away with a finger, will you grant me a wish? After a moment, the siren nodded. The harpist leaned forward, cupped her chin in hand, and kissed her. In that moment, the orphan girl knew nothing but pleasure as their lips met, felt nothing but unity as their fingers intertwined and saw nothing but hope as they finally parted and she looked truly into the harpist's eyes for the first time. It was then that the rolling waves in the river began to calm and it seemed that somewhere deep within it something glowed bright blue. Suddenly there were fishes and frogs and cat's tails and mosses and beautiful water lilies unfurling from the darkness. The two girls pulled their legs out of the river and watched for a few moments in awe. Finally, the orphan girl turned timidly to the harpist. What wish shall I grant you? Come away with me, she replied. Your beauty is wasted here. The orphan girl agreed, and the two of them ran away together to the other side of the kingdom. They found work as musicians and came to be known far and wide as the best performers in the land, and so live long and happy lives full of music and the certainty of true love. In the Riverside Village, it was said that the siren had drowned, and that it was she who had cursed the river, and that it was her death which had finally freed it of its enchantment. The people celebrated and held feasts each year afterward on the day of her disappearance and gave thanks to the stars that they were finally rid of her. In some sense, they were quite right. After all, the siren was dead. That's it. Thank you, Dalen. We really appreciate it. And thanks uh, to all our readers. We've had a very uh, entertaining series of uh, readings and presentations. And thanks for everybody who attended. This has been great. Uh, everyone will be back next year. Hopefully we'll be face to face on the third floor. Uh, keep in touch and everybody have a safe night. So thanks everybody and thanks for coming. Good job. Bye-bye. Keep writing. <laughs>